lads, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Tom Harlock and I do not have an intro, but I have spent three decades loitering this planet and during my time, I've earned a little reputation as Britain's favorite bad boy. But no matter how awful you think I am, there's nobody in this country quite as hated as the subject of today's video. This is Mick Philpot, father of many children, owner of zero washcloths, and the center of one of Britain's wildest true crime cases. I ain't done one of these in a while, so for today's video, I wanted to delve into a cautionary tale all about being careful what you wish for, cause you just might bloody get it. Have I been on the wonk this whole video? I think I've been on the wonk my whole life. <laughs> is here to prove they don't have an STI. If there's one thing we ate in Britain, it's poor people. Hence the success of 2000's car crash, Jeremy Kyle. The Jeremy Kyle Show was a daytime TV program that positioned itself as the British Jerry Springer. Oh, I shagged my cousin, but they said their dad was better. You know the type. I hope you don't. Airing for a decade before being cancelled due to the death of a guest, Jez was best known for scraping up the country's scabbiest and flinging them on a national stage. Alright Tom, that's not very nice. Where's your war? I thought it'd be there! Don't ever do that again. But before being cancelled, visiting the ITV studios in February of 2007 was Mr. Mick Philpot. 15 kids, a wife and a girlfriend. Happy cohabitation in one house. The entire show was a parade of freaks and Mick fit right in at the circus. Crammed into the three bedroom semi-detached home in Victory Road, Allerton, Derby. Fuck me, that was a mouthful. Was Mick, his wife Maraid, his mistress Lisa and their plethora of children. Since the turn of the millennium, the trio had been living as one big unconventional family, with Maraid and Lisa bearing Mick more children each and every year. In the UK, Mick had built a reputation as a massive scrounger due to his constant complaints to his local council for them to house his ever-expanding family in a bigger home. Speaking to BBC News in 2006, Mick said, There are a lot of people especially men, who would love to be in this situation, but they can't because they don't have somebody like I've got. Oh, I am happy or happy, mate, but I'd rather go to the local public toilets and shag the sharps bin. Apparently, his partners get on like a house on fire. Hmm, well, judging by my blood out nose, that's BV, but I'll pop the boots and get some pessaries, mate, because I think they're on free for two. Maybe I'll get a link set. <laughs> Isn't it true that you've also said to my research team that you would actually divorce your wife, Maraid, to make Lisa feel more equal? You'd then marry Lisa to give her your name and divorce her so that both of them are on an equal footing. That's right, because we do. I do feel guilty that Lisa's the only one who's not got my name. I think the only place your surname belongs is a bloody register, you big deviant slaphead. All right, Tom, give the audience time to hate him too. It's called storytelling, mate. Learn a bit about it, will you? Why am I so unkind to myself? Do you think I deserve it? Sound off in the comments. <laughs> Please don't. The two gals went out to work whilst Mick sat on his bony ass deciding which benefit to claim next. Talk to that, pal. Talk to that. <laughs> You're not worth it. I'm not worth it. No. What are you worth? Worth more than you. Well, according to reports, the total was 60 grand annually, fully supplemented by government benefits, which as you can imagine, piss the public off. Why should this tramp get a decent wage for sitting on his ass whilst I work hard all day? That's the British public sentiment, all right, not mine. I worked hard a single day in my life. <laughs> Mick's general Ming and demeanor earned him the nickname Shameless Mick, or as I like to call him, Scabby Prick. I'll tell you what, I won't have your job for all the money will, because at the end of the day- Would I'll... it mean you'd have to get out of bed in the morning, mate? <laughs> You wanna start? You start! You start! You start! You back here! Oh god, you're hard. And so am I. Now what on earth are we gonna do about it? I take cash card or credit. And sometimes those Big Mac vouchers on the back of bus tickets. <laughs> During the episode, we meet Mick's two lovely gals. You are pregnant with, we have to do these numbers again, Mick's sixth child, is yeah. that right? Yeah. 
Um, you're 25, you've been with Mick since you were 18. The story of Mick, Maraid and Lisa began in the year 2000, when Mick met a teenage Maraid in the local pub. The two quickly shacked up, but after being together for just a year, Mick's gauzy eye started wandering, and they landed on Lisa. To Mick, Lisa was a triple threat. A teenager, a single mum, and an orphan. Ding, 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 moving my gaff. Just explain to me how, in your mind, this this whole house thing works. Works like a normal family. Two mums is better for all the kids. Well, it can't be that efficient. Well, should find five minutes to wash your greasy mop. A high pony can't forgive everything, love. Despite her putting on a big brown smile, Maraid wasn't very happy with the arrangement. But she was young and Mick was aggressive, so she quickly complied and Lisa swiftly moved in to a caravan Mick stuffed in the front garden. Grotty and in love, in 2003, Mick and Murray got married, with Lisa being their maid of honour, obviously. We've done the, the 15 kids and the, the doll, and we've talked about work, and I can't argue about him being a father. Where is your dignity? You're 22. Don't you want a bloke to yourself? It's been said that Mick loved Lisa like he never loved Murray, and boy, didn't she know it. When you grew up, did you think you were going to share your bloke with a... Another woman? I didn't actually know. On three occasions, Mick asked Maraid for a divorce so he could get married to Lisa and then leave her so the names could be all the same. Which I think's the least of your problems, mate. Have you tried washing your ball sack? I can smell it from here. Hot vinegar and kippers. Do you not get slightly peeved that she is Mrs Mick no. and you're Mistress Mick? No. I'm being serious. <laughs> no, I don't. But Maraid refused. She didn't mind throwing away her dignity, but her marriage was for keeps. I just want to make one slight little point here. Get a vasectomy, that's what I think. By the time of his Jeremy Kyle appearance, 11 children lived at 19 Victory Road, alongside Mick and his gals. And how this man got all these women, I couldn't tell you. He must be growing pound coins as well as mushrooms under that foreskin or something. Hi, man. Hello, man. I'm Mick, pleased to meet you, love. By late 2007, Mick's second television appearance aired. This time, it was a documentary series hosted by batty politician Anne Widdicombe, focusing on families hovering the breadline. I want people to remember me for a good thing, not as a scrounger, not as a scum. I want to remember as a loving father who cares. The episode showed Mick to be dirty, nasty, and a bully to the women in his life. I am Get working. a job. I'm looking after my Get kids. Get a job. Listen, this shows you what a bitch Get you are, doesn't it? Get a job. You, useless, you are. One way or the other. I will get what I want. And what Mick wanted was a bigger house. With cameras inside the home, the living arrangement was elaborated. As the sun set each evening and the children were tucked up in bed, Mick would lead a different lucky lass into the caravan. This caravan's rocking. You may not come knocking. As you can see, this is a nice, um, nice big king size bed. This is where the, uh, the action takes place. If you know what I mean. Well, I wish you'd mean cleaning. That caravan looks foul. By February 2012, after a decade of abuse and a handful of children, Lisa was done. Telling Maraid she was taking her kids swimming, instead, Lisa sought refuge at a family member's home. When Mick found out, he was absolutely raging. Not only had Lisa taken his justification for being overcrowded, she had snagged the grand's worth of benefits from his account every month. A nasty custody battle ensued, with the couple due to meet on the 11th of May 2011. But just hours prior at 3.46, the Philpot's life would be turned upside down. The house is upside, my kids are in bed. What's your name, Bill? It's my kids, Mrs. Philpot. Mrs. Philpot. How many kids are in the house, Mrs. Philpot? I'm sick of them. The 999 call was made by a frantic Maraid Philpot with Mick quickly taking over. We've got the police on the way. Have you any idea what's caused the fire? I've never had any idea, but I woke up by doing it wrong. I can't get the neck in the kitchen. <laughs> Maraid explains that whilst her and Mick were seeking shelter in the garden, the children were stuck upstairs. As Mick and Maraid sat by and did nothing, neighbours attempted rescue. I had police officers saying, you know, come out, come out. I was like, no, there's six kids in here. But then I could hear my brother saying, look, Please be careful, please be careful. They jumped on the caravan and tried to smash the windows, but the house was over a thousand degrees, so any attempt of entry was over before it could even be fathomed. But his hope was still there. 
like mine was, until we seen the children yeah. come out. And all over was gone. Jade 10, John 9, Jack 7, Jesse 6, and Jaden 5 all died that night due to smoke inhalation, with big brother Dwayne passing later in the hospital. Jamie, you saw Mick, didn't you, round the front of the house? W what did you say to him? I apologise to him for not being able to save his kids. Street interviews from the time of the fire show just how gutted the neighbours are. He was a great dad, he didn't deserve this, neither did his children. It must be heartbreaking for them. Yeah, Mick was pretty scabby, but he was a good dad, and nobody deserved this. A few days after the fire, on May 16th, Mick and Maraid held a press conference. As Maraid sat there and took up space, Mick delivered a strange statement. First of all, I want to thank the poor firemen the police, the ambulances, the doctors, the nurses, literally everybody who's, who tried, tried to help save our children, they couldn't. He expresses gratitude, like he's just won the bloody postcode lottery. Not like the man who's grieving his family. Been down to my, our, our home, and what we saw, we just, we just cannot believe it. <laughs> oh, Nicholas, that's extremely sad. Well, I can't help but wonder why you're shedding tears from your forehead. I think they're supposed to come out a little bit lower, mate. Imagine half your family's decimated in a house fire and you can't even squeeze out a singular tear. I cried the other day because the lady in the co-op wouldn't look me in the eye. What's wrong with me? Please, I beg you, leave us alone and let us try and grieve in peace and quiet. That's all I ask. Thank you. The couple seemed devastated and cling on as they sob in each other's arms. But the police weren't having it, and they weren't convinced those tears were real. The only word really that sums it up for me is it was a sham. I've never actually lost half my family to a house fire, so forgive me for speaking out of term here, but I reckon I'd be devastated, inconsolable, begging for help. Please help me, I'm a shell of a man. But Mick, well, he just talks about himself. Bizarrely, despite it being an open investigation, Mick didn't ask for the public's help once. Almost like he knows who perpetrated the crime. And according to him, only one lass could be capable. And her name is Lisa. It would be wrong to speculate at this time as to what the cause is. However, I can confirm that a woman in her late 20s has been arrested on suspicion of murder in connection with this case. But Lisa was quickly cleared, leaving Mick looking like a right donk, and the police none the wiser. <whistles> Following the children's passing, a minute's silence was held at an Ipswich football match. It's hard to put into words how we actually, as families, feel about what happened that tragic night. After the fire, a local charity set up a fund to help the Philpots rebuild their life and pay for the children's funeral. Just remember, it's all about the six children. That's what we're doing, everything we're doing for. Thank you. As the lanterns were released and the candles were lit, the community grieved and the police investigated. On the 14th of May, it was revealed the fire was deliberately set by the front door, turning the Philpot blaze into a murder investigation. The discovery was made by the fire department's finest, Freckle, the Springer Spaniel. We held onto the dog whilst we made a bit of a, uh, an incision into the debris. And then upon putting the dog back in that area, it got an immediate indication. Oh, freckle. The arson I'd commit just for the meet and greet. Which can never happen because you're dead. Grief can manifest in many different ways. Some get sad, others angry. But Mick, well, he likes to mourn on a mic. In the weeks following the fire, the community observed some strange behaviour with Mick and Maraid. They were seen boozing up at the local pub, with Mick even jumping on the karaoke machine, serenading the crowd with a rendition of Elvis. Whilst Dwayne was fighting for his life, it's been reported Mick had to be convinced the trip to the hospital was even worth it. And when he did get there, he was trying to shag everything in sight. Well, that's a bit out of pocket, innit, Nicholas? If your son's laying in hospital and all you can think about is getting your end wet, you need it chopped off and fed to the pigs. With the fire rendering their house unhabitable, the Philpots were put up at a local Premier Inn. And because they're not thick, the police bugged their hotel room with recording devices. And it didn't take long for them to... 
will probably throw up in their mouths. On one evening, Mairead's heard to be given a sloppy gob job, but the knob she's slobbing on doesn't belong to Mix. Local Ming and prick Paul Mosley was a family friend to the Philpots, so when he was seen loitering around after the fire, nobody batted an eyelid. Well, until the police heard Mayreed glucking him back. As wild and vile as the recording was, it was what was said after that intrigued police, because it appeared Mick told Murray to nosh Paul off in exchange for his silence. Please be quiet. <laughs> proud of you. Proud of you. After the new spunky revelations, on the 28th of May, Mick and Maraid were arrested under suspicion of murder, with Paul later joining them. It's alleged Mick and Maraid Philpot and their friend Paul Mosley started the fire using petrol. They deny the charges. But the prosecution weren't having it. Although they couldn't prove they intended to kill the kids, they were convinced they did start that bloody fire, so they dropped the charges to manslaughter. The trial commenced at Nottingham Crown Court on the 12th of February 2013 and unearthed seedy details about Mick's past. Apparently, during a dogging episode in 2011, Maraid fell pregnant by a strange man and Mick forced her to get rid. The jury also heard covert recordings of Mick and Maraid Philpot taken from a hotel bedroom and within a police vehicle. In one, which is kind of hard to hear, it's alleged that Mick tells Murray to stick to the plan. Oh, it's telling the story. Mm. Look, you know something? Have they got any evidence on you? They've got nothing on me. During the trial, Lisa and a plethora of exes take the stand. And they tell of his abusive ways. Through testing, petrol was found on the trio's clothing, as well as in the kitchen sink. Mick explained this away by telling the court he hadn't showered in months. He's just a dirty bastard, which I can't kind of believe. Maraid looked frumpy and denied everything, telling the court she had no idea how the petrol got on her leggings. But she did flip on Mick, admitting she feels more like a slave than a wife. Mick tells the jury he had nothing to do with the blaze, but he did confess that just hours prior to the fire, Mick, Maraid and Paul got absolutely steaming and shagged the night away. Which doesn't surprise me, but does turn my stomach, so there's that. <laughs> Paul decides not to give evidence and exercises his right to remain silent and minging, but that's beside the point. As well as the saucy revelations, details about Mick's past were unearthed during the trial. Have I already used the word unearthed? Uncovered. Take your pick. In 1978, he was jailed for stabbing an ex-girlfriend, Kimberly Hill, after she ended their relationship. On that occasion, he broke into her house at night. He was convicted of attempted murder and sentenced for seven and a half years, but let out after just three due to good behaviour. It was determined Mick, Maraid and Paul deliberately set the fire that took the lives of all six kids. The prosecutor tells the court it was a plan that went horribly wrong. On the evening of the fire, after a night of sweaty threesomes, Mick, Maraid and Paul rubbed their one brain cell together and formulated a brilliant plan to incriminate Lisa in an arson attempt and win back his kids. In setting the house alight, Mick could present a case to the council for a bigger gaff. Lisa would look awful and he'd be the hero. Apparently, Mick wasn't supposed to burn the whole house down. He was supposed to save the kids. Hence a ladder being set up in the back garden. Unfortunately, Mick's denser than the sun's core and didn't accommodate for the open windows on the first and ground floors, acting like a chimney pulling the smoke through and suffocating the children. All Mick and Murray could do was watch as their children's lives were snuffed out, all because they're thick as shit. Congratulations, Mick. Well bloody done. A jury at Nottingham Crown Court today decided that the couple were guilty of the children's manslaughter, along with a third defendant, Paul Mosley. Mick was sentenced to life, which I guess means nothing because he's only serving 15 years. Maraid and Paul both got 17 years, being told they have to serve at least half. After all the weeks of evidence, all the drama in court, all the denials, now the prison sentence begins. As they left the courthouse, their van was pelted. I'm pleased justice has been achieved for the six children who died in this fire. But I have to say that I derive no pleasure from the conviction 
of Mick and my right Philpot and Paul Mosley. The children's joint funeral was held at St Mary's Church in Derby on the 22nd of June 2012. And honestly, it's the saddest affair I've ever seen with my two eyes. Look at these tiny coffins. Mick and Murray didn't attend because, well, they killed them, so they're banged up, boys. But the community showed up for the kids. Whether or not Mick thought the kids would go that night has been heavily contested. Personally, I don't think he cared either way. This was a headline in one of today's tabloids, Pure Evil, referring to Mick Philpott. Despite the conviction, many thought the sentences were too lenient, with Mick's own sister saying he should have been locked up for life. Victory today! They've got a man! I want to know the truth. I don't think it was long enough. It should be longer. It should have been 17 years per child. 18 Victory Road and the neighbouring house was demolished in September of 2013. We'll never forget those kiddies, but we've got to get, we've got to have closure. This is closure. The contractors that completed the work each agreed to donate their fees to the Derbyshire Children's Holiday Centre, a charity that provides trips to local kids. We didn't really want to make a profit out of the tragedy that's happened, so all the local companies said, yeah, we'll all donate our work and our fees, whatever we're going to get to charity. On the 29th of November 2019, an appeal against the length of Mairead's sentence was heard. Mairead claimed she was under mixed control and couldn't exercise a free choice in her conduct. I come to the conclusion without any hesitation that this appeal must be dismissed. After the rejection, Mairead's dad spoke outside the courthouse. She may have been dominated, but at the end of the day, she was old children's mother. She had a mouth to open and say, don't do it. Them children got no chance of appealing. Why should she get a chance? However, halfway through her sentence in May 2020, she was released on licence. After being relocated to a southeast town, Mairead was given a new identity and somehow an even worse haircut. But you can take the gal out of prison, but you can't take the greasy roots off a child killer. I'd recognise that sweaty bint anywhere. At the midway point of his term, Paul Mosley was also released in May of 2021. But he did return to prison last year due to breaching his parole terms. And Mick, well he got the big house he always wanted, HMP Wakefield. Also known as the UK's Monster Mansion. Which sounds about right. Unfortunately, he does have to share it with a thousand other sweaty men. Soz! And on that banged up note, that's all the time I've got for today's video. But if you did enjoy it and you feel so inclined, you can leave me a like. Let me know your thoughts and feelings down below in the comment box. And if you want more videos from me, you can always click subscribe. Cheers for watching, I really appreciate it. Change the batteries on your smoke detector, will ya? I can hear it beeping from here. And I'll see you boys next time. Bye!